Hey guys, my name is Wayne Brown and I'm the campus pastor at the Baker campus here at Bethany Church. And uh, we're excited to start this brand new B group semester with you. And this semester, we're gonna be going through a freedom series. And in this series, we're just gonna be pursuing Jesus and just finding our abundant life through freedom. And I just wanna let you know that we're gonna be doing a freedom conference on May 3rd and 4th. So I wanna invite you to that, mark that on your calendar. And that's gonna end the semester and it's gonna kinda of culminate all that we've been talking about. So I wanna encourage you May 3rd and 4th to be at that Freedom Conference. Now, today, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be talking about uh, in week one, how we approach God. And so our key question for today is, what is your approach towards God? You know, I think oftentimes people have a lot of viewpoints and things about God. I, if I was to do a poll on the street and ask people, what is your approach towards God? They'd probably give me a bunch of different answers. I think about when I was young uh, and what my viewpoint about God was. I remember being young and I grew up in church. And so um, my mom and dad would bring me to church a lot. I remember one time my grandmother took me to San Antonio and we went to church. And during that time, in a one week span, we went to 15 services and uh, Monday through Friday. So we went to church in the morning, church at lunch, church at night. And I remember being a 10 year old kid thinking, if this is what it takes to be saved, I don't know if I wanna be saved. I mean, it, it was just a lot. And so really I started to associate myself and associate God with church. But this is what I believe about Christianity. Christianity is something that should be enjoyed, not just endured. And uh, I think oftentimes people think Christianity is not an enjoyable thing, but it is. But it really comes down to what your approach is towards God. You know, I, I, I wanna just go through a couple different things and think about some of the stories that we all have. You know, all of us have three stories. And those three stories are just like it was at the beginning in Genesis. First of all, in Genesis, we saw that Adam and Eve were created. And all of us, we were created, we were born, right? The second story that we all have is that we all have choices. And you know what? Each one of us have a choice. They were given a choice. The choice to choose the tree of life or choose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then thirdly, we all have been tempted by the enemy. They were tempted by the enemy in the garden. And every one of us, if you live long enough, you're going to be tempted by the enemy. And so we all have that. Now, I want to focus in on that second one, that second story about the choices that we have. You know, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says this. It says, Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Two trees that he placed in the garden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, what do those two trees represent? Well, first of all, the tree of life represents transformation and really transformation through the heart. And, and God put those um, two trees in the garden. And really, when you think about that transformation, that's the tree that we should choose from. Now, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents learned behavior. And I think oftentimes that's the tree that people choose when it, when it comes to Christianity or, or their approach towards God. It's what they've been taught or what they've learned or what they think God is. And so we're going to talk about that, those choices. What does that look like? So the first way, there's three choices that we have. The first way, and this is in your book here, and you can follow along. The first choices that we have is the tree of knowledge of good and evil says, do more to get to God. Do more to get to God. You know, this is where people see God as a performance-based God. They think that you have to do a lot to make God happy. And, uh, you know, I think about the Wizard of Oz. He wanted Dorothy to dance, and he thought, and that's where a lot of people see God. Or I think about a coach who, and, a, and a player, and a player thinks, if I can just work hard and hustle real good, I'll impress my coach. And really, that's not how God is. God is from the tree of life, which represents 
that Jesus has already done it. That's the way we should approach God, that Jesus has already done it. And everything that we need has already done with, been done with God. I think that's super important, everything that we need. You know, I think enough times people think, you know, if I could just read enough scripture, if I can just pray for an hour, then I'll, I'll God will be happy with me. But I just want to read a scripture out of John chapter 5, verse 39. It says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. And you know, the, the, the Pharisees thought, if I can just do a lot, then, then God will be happy. But God has already, it's already been done, and you should choose the tree of life. The second tree that, um, the second choice that we should have is the tree of knowledge of good and evil says, keep trying to get God's approval. And you know, this is where we start to try to earn favor with God, because we think that God is mad at us all the time. And a lot of times people really do think that God sits on this throne and he's got this bat and he's just bopping people over the head when they do wrong. And so they have to feel like they have to earn God's approval. And it's not like that. But the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will say that. But the tree of life says, receive the fact that God already loves you. And look, this is powerful. God already loves you. And oftentimes people think I have to get right with God for God to start to love me. But can I just tell you something? God loved you even while you were still a sinner. And oftentimes that's the reason why people don't come to God is because they think, you know, I just got to get right. But look, there's nothing you can do to get right. God loves you so much that even while you were wrong, God loved you. And I love what it says in Romans chapter five, but God demonstrates in his own love for us this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Look, God loved you and he sent Jesus to the cross even while you were still a sinner. So accept the tree of life. The last choice that we have is the tree of knowledge of good and evil says that we have to obey out of duty. You know, a lot of times people think that the Bible is all about rules. And you know what, there is a lot of rules in the Bible. But it's not all about rules. That's not what Christi Christianity is all about. The tree of life says that I obey out of delight. I do it because I see it as a privilege. I love doing what God, uh, making God happy, and I obey out of that. You know, 1 John verse 5 and 3 says, This is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. That's important. They're not burdensome. Listen, when I think about doing the will of the Lord, I don't think about his commands as burdensome. I see it as a delight, as a privilege. Whoever has a son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. So I think that's super important for us to choose the right, the right tree, either the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or the tree of life. So there are four responses, and you say, what are those four responses? Well, they're very, very simple. The first response is this. Number one, fall in love with Jesus. Yeah, it's just that easy. We've got to fall in love with Jesus and know who Jesus is and what he's done for you. I think that's super important, to know who Jesus is. You know, this Christianity thing is a relationship thing. It's not a religious thing. It's all about relationship. You know, I think about my wife, and there are rules when it comes to marriage, you know, do not commit adultery. And when I think about that, it's very easy to go, well, I just got to focus on the rules and try not to commit adultery. But honestly, all I really have to do is fall in love with my wife. And the more I fall in love with my wife, and I do, I love that lady, when I, the more I love her, I don't even want to commit adultery. That's not even something that I want to do. So yes, there's a rule, but because I love her so much, it's easy for me to follow the rule. And you know, in John 14, 15, it says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And really the translation is there, if you fall in love with me, you obey my commandments. So really your obedience is a byproduct of the love that you have for Jesus. So I think that's so, so important to just Number one, fall in love with Jesus. 
The second thing is to serve God through relationships and not rules. You know, one lady called here to the office one day and she told me, she said, Pastor, because Jesus came, I don't have to think about the law at all. I don't have to follow any of the law. And I said, well, I don't know if that's necessarily true because um, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said this. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have, come, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The difference is, is this. The Pharisees, all they had was the law. And before Jesus came, all they did was went to a written stone and they just followed the law. They just followed whatever the law said. When Jesus came, the law was written on our hearts. And so really the law is a heart thing. And I follow the law through my heart and through the love that I have for Jesus. It's more about a relationship than it is the rules. That's why the Pharisees had such a hard time understanding Jesus because he said, you know what? You love me, but your heart is far from me. And you have, you're all about the rules. And so Christianity is not all about the rules. It's about the relationship. And I want you to catch that. The third thing is that we, the third um, um, thing that we should have is that we should have a respond. We should respond to sin with life. This is really condemnation versus conviction. I think oftentimes when it comes to sin, people really go towards that condemnation side. And I understand that because condemnation is guilt. He really, we weren't meant to carry guilt, but the enemy will bring that guilt and he'll put it on you and you'll sit there and feel that guilt. And it's, and it's really what the devil does. The Bible says that he's the accuser of the brethren. And so he brings that guilt. And when you sin, you feel that guilt and you carry that guilt and you feel like God doesn't love me and I can't go back to church. I can't go back to B group because I've messed up. Listen, there's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Conviction says, yes, I messed up, but I'm on the right track to get it right. That is where we should be. We should allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit to touch our hearts, to get us moving in the right place, and get rid of condemnation. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, one of my very favorite verses, therefore there are no condemnation, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so I don't know who's listening to me today, but I want to encourage you with something. Lose the condemnation. Let it go. God loves you and allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit to change you, but know that God still loves you and you don't have to carry that condemnation with you. Finally, the third thing is this, is to guard your heart from not going back. Guard your heart from not going back. You know, I, if you're like me, you probably got saved about four or five times before you really got it right. I remember many times lifting my hands and saying, this is my time, this is my moment, and I went back out into the world. But I remember about 20 plus years ago, the time that I really gave my heart to Jesus. I remember going to the altar, and I remember saying, God, if you take me back this one time, I promise I'll never go back. Now listen, I haven't been perfect, but I haven't been back. You know, the reason I haven't been back is because there is nothing in the world that I want. All I want is Jesus. And we have to guard our hearts from not going back. Let me just read this final scripture and we're gonna pray. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses, now choose life so that you and your children may live. Listen, I want to encourage you to choose life, the life that God has given you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for what you're doing today. I thank you for everyone who's listening today. And I pray, Father, that every day we would choose life. In Jesus' name, amen.